because she had to see and she got closer and closer. She reached up to grab hold of a limb of the tree so that she could bend down and see even more. And as she's holding on to that limb, her foot gives way and she is falling down from Scotland. Now below, the animals in the sea had watched this and they were looking up. Something was falling from Skyland. And they sent two of the biggest birds, the swan, to go up, one resting on either side of her, holding her up as they flapped one wing each to start lowering her down. But have you ever had one problem in your life that you were solving only for another to develop? She had no webs on her feet. How, were they, how was she going to live in the water? The birds were bringing her down to safety, but what was safety? And so the animals all began to talk. What were they going to do? What were they going to do? And one little voice said, I have heard that below the water there is earth. And they knew that they must go down and to bring it up. And so the first to do that was the duck. He did not make it very far at all until he came back to the surface. He didn't even make it down to where the water grew dark. The next one to go was the beaver. He knew he could make it all the way, at least to the dark water. And so down, down, down he went. But he didn't even make it and came back up empty-handed again. And next, and next, and next. And she is getting closer and closer down. And what were they going to do? And a small voice spoke up. It was that of the muskrat who said, I will go down. I will go down. I will find earth or I will die trying. And the muskrat drove down. He get, went past those dark waters, down to where the pressure was pressing in on his lungs till he could not breathe. And he, just before passing out, he felt something with his claw, grabbed it, and floated up to the surface. His friends had begun to wonder if he had died while he was there because he had been gone for what seemed a long, long time. But then he came up through the waters and they saw in his claw that he had earth. But now once again, what to do? Do you hear that old voice? Why, it's the one of Mother Snapping Turtle. Ah, oh, she had been stirred up from the bottom with everything going on. And she came up and she said, here am I. Spread the earth on my back. The muskrat was taken over in that earth, deposited on top of that turtle's back. And as it was, the swans lowered the woman to the turtle's back. And she began a shuffling with her feet. And as she did, that earth was spread out over top of that turtle's back. And it grew, and it grew, and it grew to where we are standing this day. And her hand opened up, and the seeds poured out, and all things good and wonderful was spread upon the earth. That those songs that we sing today, the songs of creation, are called the Escogne Gagne. Listen now, as the boys sing those songs, and remind you of those creation stories.
students there was the water drum and simply a gourd rattle, two of the uh, two of our old style instruments. And now Nakaya will be picking up a hand drum, and we're going to see the steps uh, of Turtle Island of the southeastern natives, an old style dance, the Eastern Woodland Dance.
So at this time, he's going to give the newest form of smoke dance or the smoke dance trick dance song. Right before we went into the presentation, I was chatting with 
with Kat that typically this presentation is about an hour and a half long and there could be even more. So this is a really shortened version for us, which I really appreciate you shortening it for us. And I know that it doesn't cover any amount that we should be knowing about your culture and the, I mean, that we, the land that we're on right now. So we really appreciate it. And we encourage you, I know they have been really busy this month, uh, Native American Heritage Month, but all year we could be learning about Native American <laughs> They do educational performance, they do every kind of uh, uh, presentations. Um, so if you are in the region and if you have these opportunities, please call them. I have their email addresses. <laughs> um, so I just want to encourage you to keep that in mind. So thank you again so much. We can, we can eat. Okay, great. Hi everyone, I'm Hal Mount. <laughs> on the live stream, this is the NTP Regional Convening. I will pass the mic on to Kita Sullivan. Good afternoon. Uh, for those of you who weren't uh, here this morning, I'm going to introduce myself to say that I was doing. A quiet Kita Sullivan, that is the way Nick Schallenstock, but Mantasanak Shinakaksanak. And um, my name is Kita Sullivan. I live in uh, Shawmut in Boston. I am the program director for the American Foundation for the Arts. I am also a Mantasanak Shinakak woman, or person. There's no gender in her language. Um, and I also want to extend my sincere gratitude. Um, it's not often that I hear stories that are so similar to mine representing. Mm the opening of anything. So to have that as a start for our day is, uh, is emotionally opening. It means the rest of my day is all good. <laughs> um, so I want to read to you um, the statement on the back of your programs um, in order to start this in a good way. Um, and then, uh, again, we have if you need to talk to any of us about the actual National Theater Project, um, that's great. But I'm, I'm going to also tell you about why we do this. The National Theater Project is a national project. We have 12 advisors who are amazing people with a wealth of experience, a wealth of backgrounds, a wealth of knowledge that is you know, it's well beyond what I, as a program director, could ever hope to accomplish. But we also recognize that we don't know everything, and we can't know everything. And so a few years ago, we started doing these convenings in areas where we do not see a lot of applications, where we do not hear from a lot of artists, in order that we could learn what the aesthetics are in that area. What are the challenges in that area? Why aren't we seeing more applications? Who are the artists that we should know? And so, um, so the, that is why we started doing this. So far we have done them in Mississippi, Phoenix, Dallas, Minnesota, now we're here in Knoxville. 
and next year, on the occasion of our 10th anniversary, we will actually be doing it for the first time in New England. So, um, so it's very important for us. It's important for us to come to you, and not for you to have to come to us. We want to learn. It's, it is our obligation to reach out to you and to learn from you in a way that is respectful, that encourages uh, networking and, and conversation and art. Um, it's not your responsibility to always come to us, and so we are here. Um, I'm going to read this and then I'm turning it over to Linda. At New England Foundation for the Arts, we believe that one of the roles of the arts is to make the invisible visible. We also believe that it is not the responsibility of those who have been made invisible to remind us that they are still here. Therefore, as a committed ally and as artists, the New England Foundation for the Arts acknowledges that the ground on which we are meeting is the traditional and unceded lands of the Chalai or Cherokee, and currently the Eastern Band of Cherokee. We honor their ancestors' past, present, and future, and recognize their continued survival and contributions to our society, as well as the sacrifices they continue to make. We also recognize that there is a long history of colonization, displacement, and forced removal, so that many indigenous peoples have come to this place, and that there is a connection between that displacement and the removal and enslavement of African peoples to work this land. NEFA values an equitable, diverse, and inclusive world, which we all interpret as all people having fair access to the tools and resources they need to realize creative and community endeavors. We acknowledge structural inequities based on race, gender, disability, sexual orientation, class, age, national origin, language, and geography, and strive to counter those inequities in our work. That's why we're here today. We will be mostly in our listening mode and our learning mode, and we hope that there will be conversation amongst you all, um, because we know that when Mina was here doing her site visit, that was the number one thing people said, oh, I really want to work with those people. I really want to meet those people. And so please take this as an opportunity to do that. Good. Thank you. First of all, I want to welcome everyone in this room on behalf of the Carpetbag Theater as we celebrate our 50th anniversary. It is our practice to enter every community as a learner. And as we learn together today, um, I hope you will take home with you um, the quality of the performers and performances that you're going to see. I hope that you take home with you the hospitality that uh, we offer here in East Tennessee. I want to acknowledge, because it is our 50th anniversary, and I, I, I particularly want to talk about uh, the future, I would like the Carpetbag Theater staff to please stand so that you can be acknowledged. Because you know, we're rolling into the next 50 years. And again, our practice is always to enter as learners. And I think we have something to share from East Tennessee, from urban Appalachia, and from rural Appalachia that's represented in this room. And I want us all to be able to share our gifts and our talents and to support one another. Because the one thing that I do know is that we, in terms of our survival in the arts and culture, and in terms of our survival as a community, um, we are going to depend upon each other. And to come together is essential, particularly now. And thank you, first of all, Kita, thank you and uh, Nifa for bringing us all together. I, I actually have very little to do with it. And so, you know, and I, I, I do get a lot of credit, but I do want to say that uh, Joe Taylor, Jonathan Clark, and, and all of the members of our community uh, are the contributors. And uh, I just want to acknowledge that. So, um, 
So we are going to move into another panel, but I just want to say thank you, Linda. Linda is also a former National Theater Project.
which has um, my comrade, Jonathan Clark. So if you come on up, the managing director of Carpet Back He will be in conversation with my woman tour, Linda Paris Bailey, the executive artistic director of Carpet Back. Shop's Roadside Theater, and it says here from 1976 to 2018. So give it up. Hi, everybody. How y'all doing? Welcome to Knoxville. Hey. As long as you've never been here before. That was a lot of noise. <laughs> Raise your hand if you have been here before. Yeah. 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 I said raise your hand and that made noise. All right. So we're about to kick this thing off. Uh, I have the absolute pleasure of speaking to two of the founders, uh, two of the founders of some of these movements in Appalachia. Uh, although Lynn Paris Bailey is not the founder of Carpet Bag Theater, most people think she is, so that's just how it goes. And Dunn Cop, uh, part of one of the founders of Apple Shop and Roadside Theater. We're going to have a, uh, a big conversation. Um, I like to, I wanted to start off by asking these two um, how did you two meet? <laughs> Well, you know, Dudley and I both confess to, um, you know, kind of faulty uh, memories. <laughs> so I, I think I first met Dudley at um, at the organizing meeting or the convening of artists, theater artists from the region, um, where Alternate Roots was formed. Yeah. So Dudley and I. Oh, do I need to do that? Yes. I'm so sorry. I do have a big voice. I was asked by my mother not to use it. <laughs> so Dudley and I met at the Highlander Center uh, at the invitation of um, people who were thinking about what was needed in the region and how our isolated existences were not creating um, the kind of environment where we could actually live. So um, there was a call and a convening, and um, I let Dudley fill in the, the um, Highlander piece, but that's where we met. And um, I had been with Carpet Bag since 74, and this was 76, is that correct? Right? Yeah. Yes. So um, I had two years of thinking about and uh, working with uh, an African theater organization in Knoxville, Tennessee. Um, and I'll talk later about what prepared me for that. But um, that's where we met. Dudley? That's all true so far. Miles Horton, uh, who was the director of Highlander Center at the time, uh, he had a dry sense of humor. I don't know how many of you all had a chance to meet Miles, but um, he said uh, to some of the black folk who were coming to Highlander for the meeting, he said, uh, now there's a, a group that I think you ought to meet. They seem to share a uh, nationalist uh, perspective, although a little different than your black nationalist perspective. They're over in Whitesburg, Kentucky. And uh, maybe you'd want to take a trip over there to Whitesburg to see what these uh, white nationalists are doing. <laughs> so that, that's how Miles uh, sort of introduced us. And um, it, it was at, at that meeting that, uh, as Linda said, that, that we met. And Linda and I both, as I remember Robin and Linda, um, both of us had uh, committed, to, I'm sure, different degrees to the civil rights movement as teenagers. So it was natural for us to be at Highlander Center uh, because we were looking at the way art and activism 
could be joined. So I had not really done all that much in the arts. I certainly had no theater training. But um, it had become apparent to a lot of people in the civil rights movement that it was important to uh, work on the cultural um, aspect of the movement and freedom. Um, and so that is what drew us, uh, drew me and others uh, to Highlander. We knew we would be better together than apart. And it, it, it rang uh, true once we were all there. We had a lot to share. We had the movement to share, but we also didn't know a lot, or at least I certainly in Roadside didn't know a lot. So we came there to really learn from each other some basic things, like how you write a contract for touring. So we were really making this up, a lot of the groups um, from scratch, and uh, it, was, it was a good meeting, and then we kept going, and Roots, of course, is going to this day. And uh, just an addendum to uh, Dudley's statement. When the invitation went out, it was broad. And I have to say that there was a significant amount of sifting that uh, happened from that first meeting. And I think that those that remained were those who were committed to art and social change. And um, I think that is the kind of foundation for our long history together, uh, Carpet Bag and Rosa. And uh, Road Company, Bob Leonard is out there somewhere, you know, and um, all of the first founding um, peoples of alternate groups. Um, but yes, there was a significant amount of fallout when we were talking about social justice. Yeah, what she means by the fallout uh, is if uh, 40 people showed up, 20 left as soon as they saw there was no money in it for them. <laughs> John O'Neill, who became very involved with Almaner, he didn't, he didn't show up. He sent somebody, one of the people in Junebug, with the instruction to keep an eye on what the white people might be doing. <laughs> So, and I'll let you get to your next question. But the lesson learned from that, show up. Yeah. I mean, if there's anything that, and I thought about this this morning in the shower, <laughs> you know, show up. Uh, because, you know, don't let people speak for you. Show up. Right. Okay, Jonathan. <laughs> what? So, um, as we begin to talk about both carpet bag and roadside work, um, I thought it were a little bit more appropriate to work in the form of story, which is something that we all do. Um, both organizations are very, very good at. Um, and I started thinking, uh, also, I, I did want to reintroduce our call. I'm going to make sure you guys know that the phrase for you to begin uh, rounding up your thoughts is, that's enough of that. <laughs> and it's been clear with both of these individuals. So I'm going to be you or just an upstart millennial uh, as we speak to this generation. It has been clear, uh, it has been clear, uh, that's enough of that is in the signifier to uh, wrap that thing up. <laughs> just so y'all know. So, in the world of storytelling, we use prompts. Um, and I thought with the help of both of these individuals, uh, I came up with a couple of prompts. Um, and thinking about when we talk about the word freedom, when we talk about things we have to fight for here in Appalachia, um, I wanted you both to begin thinking about, uh, talking about a time when it would have been easier to turn around.
people when I hung out with in Roadside. We weren't, uh, we knew it was going to be a long haul. So that's what we were geared into. Uh, and so we didn't have expectations that suddenly uh, everything was going to be good, fine. We knew it was going to be a fight. Uh, Miles Thornton was an example of a lifelong fight. And uh, I understood for that. I can say, though, there have been times when I have been very surprised and wondered whether I should uh, be doing something else <laughs> as part of that long haul. And one of those times was in the 90s, from about 1990 to 1995, when Roadside, which we were touring extensively, we'd been uh, pretty much in all the states, 43 at that time. And we uh, had a challenge, which was to see if we could uh, invert the professional theater audience while on tour. So, as many of you know, that the majority of people, 80 some percent, all the surveys say, are from the wealthiest uh, and most educated group of people. But that wasn't going to work for us because we we're working class uh, theater. And what we found is considerably performing for those audiences, they began to unwind, to undo uh, the play. And so at one point, one of the actors uh, said she found herself uh, falling into Ellie Mae Clampett um, from the Beverly Hillbillies. And that's because that's where the audience was responding. So anyway, we said, we made a decision that we would not perform in any community that did not contractually agree to work with us to bring out the entire community. So they had to sign as part of the contract that they would work with us over a period of nine months to bring out their entire community. So you can, it was a risky business decision, but it was a good artistic decision because the plays were getting corrupted. So we worked on this for five uh, years intensely. At the end of those five years, uh, we were able to demonstrate that, in fact, we had uh, attracted the inverse of the audience um, that typically attended professional theater, and we have done it nationally. And the reason we did this is because an independent tracking firm from Connecticut followed us for those five years and did all the data. So we thought, this is great. We finally have shown that it can be done. And what a boon for the box office. You know, this is, the theater field is going to really love this because now they've got another 80% possible of the people. And um, what we found out was the theater field wasn't interested at all. Well, my story really, I think, has to do with um, our local community and, and local support. I have to say that uh, Carpetbag has relied largely on national support. We don't have very many foundations in this area. We don't have um, the support of the larger community. Uh, and on a good day, we are 12% of the population. Mm -hmm. um, and our alliances with, Park, with um, Highlander uh, really brought us the community of activists so that we rely on the, the communities of color and activist communities in the area. So um, the, that lack of kind of um, governmental support, uh, you know, support on the financial end locally, that's been an issue for us. And I think where it becomes or became a kind of heartbreaker was really around real estate, uh, around owning our own home and having a place here in Knoxville. And 
we would come this close, this close, um, and somehow the city council or the mayor or somebody would scuttle that effort. It didn't matter if we had money. Um, you know, we had a time when Lenders was willing to support that effort. You know, there were times, and every, every time, um, the, uh, the city council uh, and the city government thwarted our effort. We even got a $100,000 grant, a uh, federal grant, and the city scuttled even that. So that has been, those were times when I um, kind of uh, felt as if I maybe should not be here. <laughs> um, but other than that, and I mean, you know, I, I had to, I had to really promise myself that I wouldn't cry in front of city council anymore. <laughs> I mean, I, that became a resolution: no more crying in city council because you know they don't care. So um, I think that for me, and even as I kind of come to the uh, end of my tenure as uh, as executive and artistic director, that is my one regret. And um, that means it, that's been painful. Definitely. Um, so in the same breath, uh, would you share a story? I know we talked about pain a little bit. Um, we talked about um, the time when <laughs> you both had times of thinking about you should have done something else, uh, which is hard. I don't know if there's any artist or arts administrator in this room who has never had that feeling of maybe I should be doing something else. Maybe something would pay more, maybe something would be a little less difficult. Um, but you're all here and we're all still going um, in one way or another. So talk about a time when you thought some work that you put together or your ensemble created something beautiful. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, there, there, are, there are several, and, and I split them up into, um, you know, producing and touring and presenting and programs. And I have had so many opportunities to celebrate and, and really um, define success for us. And um, I'll start with the presenting. And we've, we've, you know, presenting is difficult in, in Knoxville as well. People are just, you know, reluctant to buy tickets to some of the most fabulous stuff in the world. Um, but what I, what I remember about our presenting is that uh, we brought uh, Cultural Odyssey and Cultural Odyssey with Desa Jones. And, and we have never been in the theater, the Clarence Brown venue. Uh, which is an equity house on the campus, and it's the largest you know, kind of in the area, blah, blah, blah. Um, but we partnered with um, ARC, which was Age Response Knoxville. Uh, no longer exists. Um, and we managed to convince uh, Clarence Brown Theater that we should do this uh, Big Butt Girls, Hard Headed Women, and I'll tell you how long ago it was. Um, but what happened was that we engaged several different communities um, and we filled the house um, and we were able to do it without, um, uh, you know, without anyone having to pay any high prices for a ticket. And um, we had a, a following behind that that was pretty extraordinary. And, um, that was one of, one of the successful presenting opportunities to do. Um, I gotta say that uh, when we developed uh, Dark Cowboys and Prairie Queens and toured that show, we toured that show for probably 10 years. Um, and the good, the good side of that is that we toured to small communities and small presenters who treated us really well and who were engaged in their own communities in, in such deep ways, uh, in the deep south, in Appalachia, and uh, 
That, I think, was something that fed us, I think, uh, culturally and spiritually and, and uh, taught us a lot about engagement. So what's the question? Let's <laughs> yeah. talk about a time when you thought your work, the work that you created, was beautiful. Yeah. Well, and, and you know, I'm, I'm a little, I think that all of our work is beautiful. But, uh, <laughs> um, I think the work that led us to um, different populations. Um, I'm proud of the work that we did with partners in Kentucky. Really proud of, of that work, and that included uh, Robert Guy, who's somewhere in this room as well, um, and Apple Shop, and uh, other communities in, in Kentucky. And, uh, you know, deep south, I learned a lot. I learned a lot. I learned a lot about when you enter community, what you're asking people to risk. And I think that's a very, very important lesson. Um, what are you asking the community that you're entering to risk? So that's kind of the takeaway from, from my tour. Yeah, I guess I've talked about that. That's enough of that. <laughs> <laughs> I did want to say one thing. Um, shout out to Robert Guy um, and the Higher Ground folks in Kentucky. That was actually one of the moments that changed my life as an artist. The work that we did with Carpet Bag and the partnership there. Um, and I just always take the time and the opportunity to mention that. And that's what really made me dedicate my life to, to the arts and to changing my community with what the artists can do. So that was a time that was beautiful for me, if I can take that opportunity as the moderator for the moment. <laughs> That's not bad. <laughs> so yeah, touring, um, I, we did a lot of touring um, in more than 2,000 communities. Sometimes we would bundle it together. So one of the touring highlights was early on, we got some support from the NEA, National Endowment for the Arts, and the North Dakota Arts Council. And we were going to make a statewide tour over a month's time. So they had it in their mind, a kind of typical tour. We would come in to this town and then move on to that town. But that didn't seem like uh, such a good idea to us. And so I went out about six months early uh, to negotiate a different kind of tour. And the different tour was we, yes, we come into a community and perform, but we also wanted each community to co-present with us on the tour one of the uh, pieces, artists, that they would select. And then if they wanted to go for the three-day deal, we would make a performance with those artists and our arts. So it was all about uh, participation. One of the uh, guiding principles of uh, Rudside's work was uh, garnered from uh, a person that I used to hang out some with named Alan Lomax. And he said that uh, what you have to do is remember that there will be inherent genius in every community that you visit. So look for the inherent genius in that community. So that's what we did in Dakota. And we visited 16 communities, but there's this whole issue of context. So we also put Apple Shop films on the public television for several months before we arrived. And then we convinced the person from public radio in North Dakota to come along on the tour and file reports in a daily or a couple of three, four times a week. Uh, and so what emerged from the reporting on public radio was a portrait of uh, North Dakota with their performers and uh, the landscape, the weather. We did hit a moose as we were pulling into <laughs> Cavalier and totaled the car, but no one was hurt. And so that you can see that made a good story. So we'll hear about Appalachia um, as it connected to North Dakota and especially in North Dakota uh, emerged. 
And just one footnote, um, this uh, question of context, it's so easy to get, as we all know, here in this room, stuck out on a limb to be the only one, this, that, or the other. And so you start to feel like an appendage. And one of the times when context became so clear to me was we were performing in New York City at a, a well-known theater, the Manhattan Theater Club. And that morning, the New York Times had the coal strike, the United Mine Workers strike on the front page of, uh, of the newspaper. And so it created a context for that for that audience and that show. And it was a, a moment of beauty you asked about because you could feel the show uh, levitate, just rise up. And it was rising up, of course, not because just the actors, but it was rising up together uh, with the audience. And that's enough of that. <laughs> um, so we both, we heard from both of you uh, talk about your experiences uh, with national work as well as local impact as well. Um, would you be willing to share a story about a time when there was balance between your local impact and your national impact? Or is there one? Or yeah, was there one? surprising, they were totally eclectic in their taste. 
And one maven uh, turned to the other maven and said, these are the best Appalachian accents we've heard <laughs> in <our> years. <laughs> Both of your stories kind of have uh, hints of having to exit Appalachia to go get what you needed to bring back to Appalachia. So we know that um, through the statistics on poverty and uh, income, economics, uh, the, the money doesn't lie here. Um, depends on what business you're in. Uh, but is that the is that something that's indicative? Is that kind of the trials that you've had to go through as executives um, and administrators of theater organizations based in Appalachia? Is that something that you think people have in common who do this work here, that you have to go out and get what you need to bring it back for your communities? That's an interesting statistic or uh, thing that I've noticed uh, based on the lane um, information and that's leveraging a network for equity. Um, those of you who work on the and NPN initiative funded by Um There's an interesting parallel statistically between rural communities and African American communities in terms of the, the, the percentage of arts funding that goes to each. And it's, it was very interesting to look at those things as, as kind of parallel. Um, in, in our urban center, Knoxville, um, in terms of the arts, you are going to see a lot of music. Um, you know, Knoxville was supposed to be the Nashville, historically, so there's still that desire to bring music and to have music, and you know, we, we have a, a, a very vibrant music community. Theater um, doesn't have the same uh, embrace or activity or, or support. And you really can't rely on um, funding for the art alone. So when we think about our communities and we think about initiatives that would serve, again, both the art and the social practice, we really do have to look at organizations and foundations and people who understand that connection. And um, I think for the past 50 years in Knoxville, we have been trying to get people to understand and support that connection. So um, again, part of the lessons uh, about uh, power and the power dynamics of Knoxville is uh, uh, a lesson kind of in futility. We are probably going to have more than one African American person on city council. Even though there's a city council movement now, which is absolutely amazing and wonderful, still only one. So there are certain political realities that you have to deal with. And I think that we have been able to make a case, a much better case nationally. Uh, about the importance of those in combination with one another, particularly in, in communities of color. So, kind of that's where we are. And um, every day we are engaged in education and understanding, and trying to get people to understand um, that these are important parts of our community. So, I I'm hopeful, <laughs> but I'm still making applications to the national funding sources. Just a uh, tidbit of information about Knoxville. Um, there was a study that came out recently that Knoxville has the highest poverty rate of African Americans in the South. So we are you know, we are doing really good at one thing, and it's making sure that. Black people do not have money here. And that's what Knoxville is really, really good at. And that's kind of that's kind of one of the biggest challenges as I begin to take over Carpet Bag as this transition uh, begins next year. 
uh, that's the that's the goal is to make sure that people understand that and make sure that people understand the work that we have to do because um, if that's not a challenge, I don't know what is. But that's our audience. The people, the audience that we have here with Knoxville Carpetbag being in a legacy historical uh, African American theater company, that's the challenge that we have to face, and it's the biggest challenge in the South for the people who we serve. Yeah, I, uh, I really uh, think that's it. It's a, it's a question of who's in the house, who you want in the house. and. Um, you know, who's, who's the audience? Somebody once asked me what would happen if all the support, uh, government, uh, foundation, whatever support, went away from roadside, what would happen to roadside? I said, well, uh, we'd be taken in by the community, but we wouldn't be able to apply ourselves to this work except on the weekends or when we could get out of work. Uh, community would take us in and uh, we would continue to do the work, but we couldn't be as intentional about it. And this ur urban, rural connection that uh, Linda just talked about, is, it's really been our experience. Um, years ago, uh, I used to watch and see who, which communities in the U.S. would be at the bottom of the poverty list at the bottom of the poverty scale. And so I noticed for a while there, uh, Central Appalachia was playing tag with Pregonis in the South Bronx, or with the South Bronx. And uh, so I, after seeing this for a couple of years, you know, I don't know, the paper would say, well, we need the South Bronx this year. They need us. And so I figured they must be our uh, long lost cousins uh, up there. And I said, well, who's the theater company up there in the South Bronx? And it was pretty honest. So we, uh, we got together with their kinfolk, and that was like 25 years ago, and we're still making uh, plays together. So as we move forward, um, I kind of touched on this, but I wanted to pull a little bit more out. Um, talk about a time when uh, either Carver Bag or Roseanne knew that it was connected deeply to your community. You know, Jonathan over here, um, some of you have heard this story, but Jonathan came into Carpetbag as a 13-year-old, actually you were 12, you were, the grant was for 13 year old, so you became 13. <laughs> <laughs> we knew the potential, <laughs> so we just said, he's 13. Yeah. Um, but he came into our youth program, and one of the things that I think we have been particularly successful at is what um, I would call, you know, growing our artists and, and leadership in the arts. And um, when I when I look around the room uh, in Knoxville today and look at the connections, um, we haven't talked about Joe Talbert. You know, Joe Talbert was a teenager as well. Um, and, uh, you know, people who work with us for short periods of time, like Dajé. Um, I think that these kinds of seeds that we've planted that have um, blossomed, and there are many, many more. I mean, my favorite thing is for somebody to walk up to me like some of the community members have done, and say, <clears throat> especially if they're six foot tall and like 280 pounds, Linda, um, I've got a uh, daughter, she's like 13, and uh, I want to have a program, you have a program for her? And, uh, and he's got his you know, elbow on my shoulder, and he's one of our youth members <laughs> of this, you know. Um, you know, that, that's something that I'm proud of, and I, we continue to do that, and, uh, you know, uh, continue to have a, a youth program director that, you know, has vision 
and um, that we are pre preparing young people for work in this field and in other fields, of course. But that has been, I think, really uh, one of our strengths and, and one of the most rewarding ones. What you got there? Yeah, um, yeah, it was. Uh, I remember vividly. We got a, a call at the uh, office, and a uh, uh, woman uh, said that her father had just passed, and she wondered if if we could come uh, sing to his funeral. And it was at that point that I knew um, the connection was deep and beyond just the the theater space. And um, so that, I'll tell you a funny story though about connecting to the community is not too long, John. But <laughs> we had uh, um, a friend come from uh, a national foundation, a Ford Foundation. And uh, like was said earlier, really glad we're starting to maybe have more convenings uh, like this. I think it's very important. Back in the day, uh, people at the foundation always would get out and do their field work. And <clears throat> the person who came down to see one of our plays in Whitesburg, at intermission, she got really mad and came up to me. She said, you set me up. And I said, what do you mean? She said, the people to my left and right all know the songs. They're singing along. And they are sometimes completing the lines. I said, well, uh, pick a place after, and when you go to any place, I'll make the arrangement. And afterwards, of course, she came up and said, same thing happened. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in that same line, um, talk about a time when you, during your work, when you were very surprised. Solutions. <laughs> but, um, you know, we did this partnership and it was um, with the Red Summer, which we just remounted. And um, they said, what we're going to do is we're going to pay you in and we're going to, this is a fundraiser for our organization. And I said, oh, oh well, we'll just kind of see turns out and whatnot. That was one of the few local sold out performances in our history in Knoxville. Completely sold out. Um, they raised a lot of money, which was really good. Um, that was a surprise. That was, uh, no. Definitely a positive. Definitely a positive. Okay, you're done. So a little coda I forgot to that last story I told with the foundation person. Um, she was so excited at, at the discovery uh, that this was going on in theater in the U.S. that uh, she spent the rest of the evening celebrating with moonshine. Was it? She, she had a great time. <laughs> so. Um, I, there's so many surprising things that happen, of course, on, as they say, so many different levels. But here's one that got me. We had just come in from uh, touring. We'd been in a big city, I can't remember, maybe Chicago. And uh, we were coming back for a, a benefit performance at the Bromley Gap uh, Hunting Club. Now, the Bromley Gap Hunting Club 
club was one room with a coal stove and what we were trying to do was to stop the Brownlee uh, Gap uh, project that was going to flood uh, Brownlee Gap, much like the TVA uh, flooded at so many homes near here. So uh, we came in, the, the place was of course packed. In fact, the, uh, the kids were sitting right at the uh, actor's feet when it was that packed. Of course, we also, uh, but since we were the actors, uh, got a place near the coal stove because it was coal. And uh, anyway, there's a point in this one play where uh, where the actor goes to a movie dance member. And the kind of setup is that there's this guy, Henderson Mullins. This is a somewhat true story. Henderson Mullins had a biting dog. And um, Ben Henry Adams had told Henderson Mullins that if that blankety blank dog bites me, I'm going to kill him. Well, what happens is Henderson rushes in because he finds his dog like a day later dead. So Henderson rushes in. John Adams, uh, Henry Adams, Rob, Bad Henry Adams, he's sitting there at the supper table. And he's eating. Well, Henry Adams, Bad Henry Adams, never laid his gun down when he slept, when he ate. And Henderson pulls his gun and he's going to shoot him. And uh, uh, Bad Henry shoots him up, kills him right up, shoots him through uh, the table. Well, the actor of this point in the setup goes to an audience member and says, would you mind playing Henry Adams? Just pretend you're eating. And so usually the audience member gets the hang up, pretends they're eating, and gets to shoot this guy, you know, at the dinner table. Well, the guy sitting in the front row, an older man, uh, was deaf. So he was in the front row, of course, so he could follow lips, but uh, he was deaf. So he didn't get all of the setup. So when the actor went to him and said, sort of aggressively, will you be bad Henry Adams and pretend they eat to eat, the guy pulled out a knife and went. <laughs> he was surprised. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so as we uh, begin to wrap up, we've got about seven or eight minutes left. Um, I know the question is in everybody's mind who has a little bit of knowledge about both of you and your organizations as we talk about transition. I wanted to take 30 seconds. Not for this whole conversation, just how I was going to surprise you both with this. Uh, I wanted to take 30 seconds and think of five words. This is a little uh, repertoire out of my friend Stephen Sack from Universes uh, out of his book. Take 30 seconds to come up with five words about transition. It's my one count to 30.
about um, the landscape that shifts and changes. It's about um, being confident that the allies will support you, being confident that um, you have, uh, and this is a collective view, uh, have listened uh, to all of the amazing uh, influences, women tours, mentors, um, all of the information that has been collected over time by so many, so many people. And I, I want to, you know, you mentioned Miles Horton, who I worked at Highlander when Miles was there, so it was, it was fun. Um, but I also want to, to mention some names like John O'Neill, um, who was certainly a mentor to me. Also, Jane and Hubert Sapp at Highlander, uh, mentors to me. So, so many uh, people who uh, taught me how to do this work. And um, I hope that I've passed on some of those lessons that I've learned from. Uh, some of you are in this room. You know who you are. Um, but uh, it's very important to me that we honor um, our elders and those who brought us to where we are today. So that's my statement. Uh, the word uh, that comes to my mind is uh, generous uh, as the, a key word in the transition. Uh, later today, you'll, uh, on the 430 panel, you'll be uh, Becca Finney, who's the new director of Roadside. She just started in September, first around the first of September. And, um, it's about uh, passing on uh, the stories uh, that uh, my generation and roadside has. I'm just, you know, one of a whole generation of actors and writers and musicians. And if you extend it to Apple Shop of filmmakers, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, there's, there's a great wealth of stories that need to be uh, generously uh, shared. And that's kind of how I came up, um, was on stories. Uh, people like Ed Brown, Rep Brown's uh, brother, John O'Neill, people like that. After we did whatever our business was, we'd go out and get some beer and go in the backyard and barbecue. And uh, they would get to arguing about SNCC, and that was a great education for me. Uh, why this worked, why that, why you didn't do this. And so I would, I would just sit there and take it all in. And, and that's really how I got uh, whatever bearings I had through their generosity. Oh, wow. Well. So, I did want to, we only have a couple of seconds left. Um, I did want to open this thing up for questions, but we do have about 15 minutes after this is over to a network and ask some questions and do all those good things. Does anybody have a burning question for one of these two individuals? Yes. Can we can we expand that to any comments or? Uh, I was about to. Okay. <laughs> 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 we got no questions, but as Linda pointed out, we have no comments. <laughs> Claudia. What's still in your tank right now? Individually <laughs> or organization? <laughs> okay, so I'm, I'm, you know, I'm quickly coming to closure. I mean, like December 31st. So, um, what I'm excited about is that I am, I am a, a solo playwright, and I get to focus on on that. Um, I also get to uh, uh, 
say things like, I'm looking for uh, uh, residencies and places and, uh, you know, uh, support for my individual work. Uh, certainly, I, I, you know, carpet bag is always my first love, but uh, now I get to kind of fly out there and uh, do some other things, and I'm, I'm excited about that. I just I just went to Jacob's School for the first time last week, and uh, I've been hearing about it for like 20 years. Never <laughs> true, <laughs> never true. Why not? So um, just opportunities to do more work and to really focus in on, on some of the things that I that I hope to do. Yeah. That's not bad. <laughs> that <would be> <laughs> yeah, I'm ex uh, uh, very excited about uh, the new core leadership. Rugside, Beth Finning, and Ben Fink. Uh, ben joined us uh, maybe three years ago, and uh, it's exciting that they've got plenty of ideas and they're pushing ahead and they're not getting in any cul de sacs. Awesome. Well, thank you all for being with us. Uh, I guess we'll end it by saying that's another day. <laughs>